Salams, this is People's Dispatch and you're watching the Daily Debrief coming to you from our studios here in New Delhi with me, Siddhant Ani. On the show today, we have Prabhupada Prakasa talking about submarines, nuclear submarines that is, for Australia. And much ado about Gary Lineker and the BBC. Uh, first up, submarines and the self-proclaimed leaders of the free world have announced from a US naval base in the Sunshine State of California how Australia will acquire nuclear submarines under the umbrella of the military alliance known as the AUKUS. Joe Biden, Rishi Sunak and Anthony Albanese all addressed the press from the Point Loma base in San Diego, where they claim the military alliance is aimed at preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific. The plans for the new submarines uh, go well into the 2030s and beyond, leading several commentators to wonder what exactly the thought process is, given glo uh, growing global multipolarity and the ever-real impacts of human-induced climate change. But of course, before the Indo-Pacific is free and open, Australia will have to spend some cash, and they'll do so by buying three nuclear-powered submarines from the United States. First revealed 18 months ago, the alliance was formed after the US agreed to supply these nuclear subs to Australia, superseding an ex existing deal between France and, the, uh, and Australia. Uh, France have, of course, now been left out of a part of the world they consider very much a part uh, or sort of within the sphere of their colonial influence. Uh, the AUK-US alliance is clearly positioned against China in a region that may well be the next major global flashpoint, if it isn't already. To talk about all this and a little bit of football afterwards, we have with us uh, NewsClick's editor-in-chief, Prabir Pukayasa. All right, uh, Prabir, good to have you in our studios today. We have you for the entire episode. We're talking about uh, things as seemingly uh, diverse as nuclear submarines and football. Uh, but somehow I'm sure we'll manage to find how the dots are connected. Uh, uh, first up, uh, are you at all surprised by the announcement uh, made in sunny California by the three, some of our uh, favorite three white men, uh, well, I don't know if Rishi Sunak counts or where he is. Honorary white. Honorary white. Uh, uh, talking about this quite actually future-looking uh, nuclear deal to arm essentially Australia with nuclear-powered submarines, uh, what, what do you make of the announcement and, and the plans that Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States are hatching for the Indo-Pacific? Well, the Indo-Pacific part is relatively more clear. Because if you take Australia, it's regarded in Southeast Asia as an ex-colonial power. And even now, its policies towards Southeast Asia in terms of immigration, as you know, yeah. is extremely racist. Mm. And in that sense, Australia's immigration policies have always been racist towards Asia. So that's therefore uh, not surprising that Southeast Asia doesn't warm up to Australia, mm. as Australia might think they do. Mm the same illusion hmm. that ex-colonial powers have with respect to colonies, that the colonies must be really in love with them because that's what their textbooks say, what was a civilizing mission Absolutely. in all this part of the world. Hmm. The interesting part is they replaced, in this case the UK, replaced what would have been the French, who already had a submarine deal. And they were supposed to give diesel-powered submarines, if you remember, mm. to Australia. And they would have given it a shorter time span mm. than what this AUK US deal is about, mm. which are going to give nuclear submarines. But starting with uh, three of them, by I think the US wants to supply a little earlier. Later on, the, the latest ones, which will be manufactured, which looks like the 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 reactor will be manufactured in Britain mm. and it will be fitted into the nuclear submarine. Uh, this is going to be, which is going to come from United Kingdom and the Rolls-Royce uh, pressurized water reactors are going to be used. Mm. Now, if you take that, that time frame, earliest is 39, it probably goes to 40, into as various people have mm. said. Mm. And so its significance in, uh, say, another what, 20 years down the line, <laughs> who knows what yeah. is the picture of the world at that time. Mm. So if you look at that picture, it seems to be centered around essentially uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia, including Japan, which is the quad part minus India, mm. which is the military alignment that the US wants. And it seems this orc US is really for Southeast Asia, mm. while 
the East Asia is Japan is the fulcrum of that along along with the United States, Taiwan being the Ukraine of the East, so to say, right. that a war may be fought between the US and China oh, in Taiwan. Right. Mm. So given that, Australia is therefore really coming into this agreement, mm. throwing out the French and bringing United, the United Kingdom in has always been a big question mark. What does it give the Australians apart from losing France's support? And French were actually telling the United States, hey, in Oceania, Indo-Pacific, I'm a much bigger player mm. because I've got this ex-colonial islands, which yeah. are officially French overseas territories, but really colonial Colonies. possessions of the French. And therefore, they have the largest, actually, uh, what would be called the uh, zone, mm. which they can control, mm. both in terms of uh, what their littoral coastline would say, 12 miles and so on, nautical mm. miles, mm. but also the, as the, the economic zone, uh, economic zone mm. is. Mm. So that, that given, France would have been a much better, bigger player. They already had a submarine uh, agreement. So we haven't understood the, what is the meaning of this, except this is the five eyes core of the United States NATO alliance, mm. if, you, if you will though Australia is formally not a part of NATO. Right. So this is the core of the Five Eyes countries coming together. That's the only other way we can see okay. what this means. But the ambit of this is really Southeast Asia. Mm. Of course, people have laughed already about that uh, Australia says this is to protect their trade with the rest of the world. Mm. Well, the major part of the trade in that part of the world is with China. China. And their main enemy in that is China. So as a very famous video, which goes all, has gone all over the place, mm. that it, the discussion is that you are protecting the, this Navy, you are using all of this, your Navy, your main enemy is China, mm. and to protect your trade. Who's your trade with? China. China. So <laughs> this, this conundrum, as it were, still stays. Yeah. Yeah. But looking these things out, the idea of transfer of technology to Australia, the in 2040s, these submarines entering uh, the Australian naval force. Mm. This seems a very far cry from today. Mm. And the fact, therefore, they gave up the French uh, technology and French uh, collaboration is something the Australian XPMs have questioned. But it still is in course, very clearly. Mm. And the United States also very clear that its capacity to build submarines is such that they will reserve it for themselves. Yeah. They're giving three made the US made submarines uh, to Australia, mm. but bulk of it really is going to come from UK. That is now clear. Mm. So yes, interesting, but where it gives Australia in terms of the Navy, who the Navy is going to be against, yeah. will they have the manufacturing capabilities ever mm. to nuclear submarines over there? Mm. And of course, the big question mark that if you allow nuclear reactors to be maintained or to be owned by uh, Australia. Mm. Does it also mean they will also have the uh, nuclear fuel capabilities mm. transferred to them? Mm. And if that is so, is it a violation, violation of, of the, the NPT. NPT? So those questions, the question marks still remain. Absolutely. So, but as you know, those questions as far as US is concerned, uh, it doesn't <laughs> really bother them mm. because they say all these rules and treaties are for others, mm. not for us. Yeah. And that is still the picture they carry with them. But increasing the world is actually starting to disagree with that picture. Yeah. And we have seen that, that China, Russia, India, Brazil, Mexico, mm. who wants to join BRICS, have all uh, are now emerging as centers of power in their own right. Mm. So where does it leave old colonial powers, uh, the settler colonial powers like the United States and Australia? It's a big question. Fair enough. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave this story f uh, here for today. But uh, we'll ask you to hang around because we're talking about Gary Lineker next and, and he's someone who uh, back in 1986 you've watched uh, play the World Cup. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's happening with the BBC uh, and Gary Lineker. In fact, we can get uh, straight into it. He's been reinstated now, sort of ending this two, three day row that has dominated uh, headlines, even on the BBC itself. It was quite uh, funny to see the BBC doing a live blog covering what's happening within the BBC. Uh, but, but that's how important they consider themselves to be and, and, and uh, this is a program match of the day that's been on since the early 60s or the mid 60s and Gary Lineker himself has spent over 20 years uh, on the program. Uh, 
Uh, how, how do you view this series of events that led to him being asked to step back and now being brought back in? Well, the crucial issue with the, the tweet that he did, mm. which he compared the immigration policies of the Tory government, particularly mm. of the Home Secretary Suela Braverman, mm. uh, who has roots in South Asia, mm. Mm. that uh, they stop the ship, mm. stop the boats, stop, stop the, the boats, boats. Yeah. stop the boats, targeting the boats which were coming with the immigrant population from, let's face it, West Asia, Africa, North Africa, mm. through Europe into the United Kingdom. Mm. Two things which Dai Lilleker also has pointed out mm. is that the number of refugees that the European countries have taken is much larger than what UK has taken. Yeah. And the UK's target is to keep the Asian and African refugees out of the United Kingdom. Mm. They have nothing else to offer on this issue, mm. except of course offering the immigrants to be disposed of in Rwanda, Rwanda. which is one of mm. their policies that they have. Mm. Of course, the question they don't raise is why are there so many refugees coming from a few countries? Mm. And if we look at those few countries, you'll see it's Afghanistan. Well, you can have the troops there. Mm. It's Iraq. You can have the troops there. Mm. Libya. You can have its troops there. And of course, Syria and Iraq. Mm. Now, mean. all of these are places where the UK has intervened, mostly without any United Nations sanction. In fact, the only place they had some some quasi uh, legality, hmm. but not to the extent of putting the boots on the ground over there, is a no-fly zone over Libya, hmm. where they could claim there is a United Nations Security Council yeah, resolution. Definitely. All the rest of it are illegal. Hmm. No questions on that. No questions why are there refugees. No question how many have you taken compared to, say, the Ukraine refugees who have come. So all of this was basically a clear racist issue that we don't want brown and black people to come into the United Kingdom. That's the sum and substance of it. This has been an old Tory party bugbear, as well as the further white racist uh, ideologies yeah. of other parties, Ian Paisley and so on. Mm. So this is an older thing. So I think we can understand where the Tory party is coming from. Yeah, absolutely. Lineker's quote was that he compared them this language to the language of the Nazi, Nazi Germany. Mm. And therefore, the issue was, of course, uh, the whole attack on him was that he's comparing this to Nazi Germany mm. and therefore belittling the Jewish Holocaust. Mm. So that and and somehow eroding the BBC's uh, rules on impartiality. No, that is an even more tricky point. Yeah, absolutely. The political yeah. argument was that he is comparing the British party, mm. Tory party, to the Nazi Germany, therefore whitewashing Nazi Germany mm. and, be, and therefore reducing what happened to the Jews. Therefore, mm. this is anti Jewish statement that right. he's doing. Mm. This is anti Semitism. Anti you know, their understanding of Semit, yeah. that only Jews are Semite. Semite. Semitic mm. and Ar Arab population is not Semitic, not. which is, of course, nonsense. But mm. leaving that out, mm. the second part of it is the BBC impartiality. Till now, people who do specific shows on BBC express their political opinions, as other people have pointed out. For instance, somebody does a cooking show and supported Brexit. Mm. There are a whole mm. number of other people who have done that. That time, the impartiality of a BBC commentator never came into uh, controversy. Mm. So this was because he really criticized the Home Secretary. Secretary. And it's not because of politics, but the Tory party leadership was being criticized specifically that this reaction took place. Mm. And of course, it also raised the issue that the BBC chairman mm. owes its position to essentially Boris Johnson, to whom he had arranged an 800,000 pound loan. Mm. And then he got his BBC chairmanship. <laughs> so this has drawn all attention on attention all these issues. But the key issue really is that this question of impartiality by a commentator who is not in that sense an employee of BBC, yeah. but a, essentially would be con considered as an independent contractor, contractor. Mm. that it only seems to apply on Lineker, but not on others. As mm. you said, Lineker, of course, uh, is an icon in the United Kingdom, mm. particularly the English football, because yeah. A, he was a 
very important player. He holds the largest number of goals, except I think Bobby Charlton. He's well, just, now it's of course uh, Harry Kane uh, has yeah, and has Wayne crossed Rooney that. have crossed yeah. that. But, but yeah. uh, and his time, he was just one goal behind Bobby, Bobby Charlton. Mm. So therefore, people know him as a footballer. Absolutely. And uh, after that, he's been a very able commentator mm. Mm. in BBC with a large following, close with a to huge nine following. million uh, yeah. followers on Seems Twitter. Seems to be a huge following, mm. and of course. Bobby Charlton is also one of the figures in that famous goals that we talked about. But yeah. he scored, scored the first goal. Mm. And then the, the two famous goals, Maradona's, one is the famous hand of Diego, hand of God's hand goal, goal, which probably was a handball. Mm. And the second goal <laughs> was the brilliant run from the half line that Maradona made, cutting right to the British yeah. defence, straight to the penalty box, mm. scoring a goal. Mm. Of course, Britain has made much of the hand of goal, mm. but the hand of God goal and how they lost because of that. Mm. They don't talk about the 1966 World mm. Cup, which was also probably an even more controversial <laughs> goal, <laughs> which is yeah. the goal that I think Geoff Hurst Jeff scored. Hurst, yeah. And uh, that was uh, probably not a goal. <laughs> Probably if we had the goal line technology we have today, it yeah. would have been considered not a goal. Germany has protested uh, the, from bitterly about mm. that goal, which gave Britain, uh, England, the World the Cup. World Cup. Uh, for the only time, uh, for the men at least. Uh, me, you know, this kind of, uh, as, as politics marches quite uh, steadily to the right, this kind of silencing of uh, any voice outside of, of that sphere uh, seems to be becoming a thing. Uh, I mean, I'm, and, and you're someone who watches, not uh, participates in, but also watches the media in con other countries, in India particularly. Uh, what do you make of, of that aspect of, of this entire debate where, where uh, you know, the more right-wing sort of uh, tabloids or, or outlets uh, jumped on to uh, the bandwagon to kind of... Uh, talk about their own agendas. You know, it's important that they failed mm. because Gary Lineker had the wide support of the footballers who refused to participate in any BBC program as long as Lineker was uh, under this quote-unquote suspension mm. and so on. Mm. And it raised all kinds of issues that how is it that you're doing it for him but not for others. Yeah. So the complete partiality, if you will, mm. uh, of this step. It's the power of footballers because England football is the iconic sport, mm. not cricket as Indians might believe. It's really football. Yeah. And the British football is working class roots. So therefore, mm. it's also closer to the people in, in that in sense, that sense, including, of course, also right wing hooligans yeah. who infested the sport in 60s, 70s yeah. and 80s. But leaving all that out, the power of sports has always been there. In fact, apart from film stars. Mm. The sports people have the maximum of social power, mm. if you will, in any country. Yeah. And uh, the British footballers have spoken out in this instance. It has also black footballers who are mm. also iconic today in the UK. Mm. So I think all of this is to the good that, yes, sports is not free of politics. This mm. whole bogus argument that sports is free of politics, that has really been torn apart. Mm. And, uh, you know, in India... Our cricket has the same iconic status as football does. Absolutely, yeah. But it's also interesting that Indian cricketers, and it's a money issue as well, because mm. they don't want to lose the huge money, both from television as well as IPL and so on. Mm. And uh, therefore, they're unwilling to speak out. Indian cricketers have never really spoken out much mm. on any of these issues, and less so today, except when fellow cricketers are abused, mm. uh, Sh Shami, Shami. Mohamed yeah. Shami, for example, even recently. Yeah. So, but uh, on other issues, they have been silent. In fact, it was Bollywood who was willing to speak mm. up earlier, mm. but as you know, the kind of attacks on uh, Shah Rukh Khan, on Deepika Padukone and others, there is that uh, silencing, slow silencing there also. The question is how much they will succeed or not succeed depends on what is the general temper of the people, mm. how they're willing to accept it. In the UK, clearly the sportsman revolt had a huge impact. Yeah. Will similar effect take place here? Question mark. It also, I think, depends on what is the social mood of the people. Mm. Tory party in the Uni United Kingdom is a little bit on the ropes, to yeah. put it mildly. Yeah. And therefore, you know, any stick is good enough to beat, yeah, them, to with. beat them with. So, a lot depends on the larger political climate of that specific country, whether people will speak out or not. Mm. And I think that is a country-by-country country issue. It's not really that you can generalize. Yeah. Yes, in our country at the moment, I think people are not willing to speak out so openly 
because the climate has become much more difficult for them. Mm. And let's face it, mm. the, pick, the warnings are there, both on social media as well as what actions are taken, FIRs are filed, yeah. various other steps are taken. So given that, I think the climate has to also change. Mm. It's an interactive thing whether the climate will change because of people's actions right. or, or the people's the climate changes, then the people's actions start. Mm. I think it's basically symbiotic. Mm. Those both have mm. to take place together. But yes, I think the UK sportsmen have played a role. In the United States, we saw on taking the knee and this kind of issues, racism, slavery, head, whatever the, the remnants are there on yeah. this sportsmen coming out. India question mark. Right. Other countries, question mark. Yeah. Brazil, yeah. the other place where there used to be sports mm. activism, question mark. I mm. think these are In fact, in some, with Brazil, we saw during the recent election how, you know, in, in a way uh, that uh, gold and green iconic shirt of the Brazilian football team has also as a symbol been appropriated by the political right. Uh, so, so like you're uh, rightly pointing out, these these kind of interactions can go in both. Uh, yeah, but I think that's sense. rather difficult to appropriate because a set of footballers have also been on the left mm. very much. So Absolutely. Even True. now, yeah. you have those footballers, Richarlison, for example. So these these figures are there, and yes, Pele was very apolitical. If Absolutely. You will. He yeah. kept quiet almost mm. on all these issues, mm. but it's not for everybody. And of course, if you take uh, Neymar, mm. he has been on the other side. On so the other I side. think the uh, Brazilian football we have to watch. Mm. It has always been partly political. Mm. The clubs are also politically Absolutely. divided. Yeah. And yeah. this is something across countries. You'll see Egypt, in Arab world, all of this. Football is also very closely associated with politics. politics. And a lot of it is working class politics. And therefore, <clears throat> these issues do percolate into the sport itself. Mm. But once big money is there, mm. then of course people are then much more uh, scared Wary. to open out. Mm. It was good for a change at least to see uh, on-air talent sticking up for each other because it is otherwise, uh, you know, even in this industry because there, are, there is big money involved here as well, uh, it is otherwise quite a doggy dog kind of scenario where you're just waiting for one of these incidents to happen and somebody to get cancelled so that it opens up a spot for someone else to take. Uh, but thanks very much for, uh, for all of that uh, and your time today, Prabir. Uh, and with that also we'll bring to a wrap this episode of the Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Uh, don't also forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.